<laughs> so we would have to change everything at the last minute. And we, we had cemented a very good relationship with the non-uniformed Secret Service. And this was what Len did. On the very first day of our vigil, they knew Brenda Radford had put the text of the amendment, because we held the text of the amendment always, and it was a silent vigil. And there was a rainstorm, and it was summer, and the wind blew as it blows up here when you have a thunderstorm. Oh, and she, Brenda had done the, our first banner with Velcro on a flannel banner, green banner. And all our letters blew off into the White House <laughs> lawn. What was, what was on the banner? It was the Equal Rights Amendment. Oh. ERA. The text. The, the text, text of the amendment. So it <laughs> and at the time they blew off. <laughs> and then what was fascinating was that several of the women who were in the Secret Service immediately ran out there and gave us back our letters. <laughs> and at that point, we realized that there was some sympathy. There was a Reagan in that White House, but there also was a certain amount of sympathy for what we were doing. They were, the they were cleaning up Yeah, the they were helping the litter problem. Well, and we, got, and we got to know the women, and we used to bake cookies on their birthdays, and you know, there was, this, and then one day, I got a call at six in the morning, from a voice that I recognized. And he said, I'm not telling you my name, lady. I said, that's fine. He said, they are going to arrest all of you today. And it doesn't matter whether you have a permit or not. This is it. And it was one of the, it was one of the Secret Service guys. What, but what did you do? Well, I called the Civil Liberties Union and, and then I happened? called then I called uh, some legal observers because what we needed was attorneys there who understood our permit and who understood what was going on. And so you went ahead with, it, with, with, a, with that situation? We went ahead and uh, it was an amazing process. We ended up in this suit in which the Reagan administration wanted to stop all demonstrations in front of the White House. From everybody. From everybody. <coughs> And they were saying that we were really dangerous. <laughs> well, you'd have to understand that many of the women who were in the vigil were also mothers, and we would, they would bring their diaper bags and set them down by the banners, and there were little kids running around, and Lenny would bake cookies, and I mean, it was, it was, it was really subversive, it was obviously you know about culture, threatening. Some of them have strange things in them. Yeah, oh, well. well. So here we were, and, and we did in fact get arrested, and the whole issue did go to court. And there were 10 Justice Department attorneys there. I guess you. Yes. They wanted to stop any demonstration. And we were lucky enough at that time that Edith Mayo was the archivist at the American History Museum. She was the women's archivist. And she came to court in front of Judge Bryant and talked about how the, the uh, New England Working Women's Association had demonstrated in front of the White House in 1820, and that our banners were the same colors as their banners, and Alice Paul, I mean, she and gave the pictures, the, and it was so funny, a fair number of us were Quakers, so Judge Bryant talked to his clerk, and the guy who does the announcing when the judge comes in would say, uh, Judge Bryant is entering, and all of you may remain seated. <laughs> and because it was, Quakers uh, have a testament against standing uh, for indifference. Yeah, indifference to people. And uh, it was an astounding process because, and in the end, we went to appeal, and our appeals panel had both Bork star on it oh. and they ruled for us <laughs> maybe the only two good things that Bork and Star ever did Seriously. but it was it was such an amazing experience you asked about the spirituality and what it meant and from my perspective it was again a real case of tolerance is way too mild a word um, 
on the Women in Religion Committee, I was always George's token atheist, and that was completely acceptable to everybody. And there were some token witches, too. Yeah, yeah, there were all kinds of things. And, and so we, we all did our thing, and I happened to do the printing for the Women in Religion Committee, and, and that worked. But there was another, a couple of stories, one of which I ran into Georgia on the streets of Washington, D.C. I believe it was on 17th Street one day, and was just chatting with her. And I said, Georgia, I don't know how you have the patience to work with the churches because it seems so slow. And Georgia said, as only Georgia can, oh, Pat, it is so exciting. They're only five years behind us. <laughs> And less than two weeks later, I was talking with another feminist, DC feminist, very well known to all of you, now lives in Virginia, and I won't name her, because I don't, don't really want to embarrass her, but I think at the time she styled herself as a very radical lesbian feminist. Um, and I was chatting with her, and I said, you know, George is just amazing working with these women in the church. And this woman said, I don't know how she can work with them. They're five years behind us. <laughs> Absolute true story. It was like, and, and so which is it? And I think that in Northern Virginia, we kept that they're only five years behind us. Yes. Yeah. And, and, more, and more than that. When uh, Sonia Johnson was kicked out of the Mormon church. Right. And, and right around that time that they had the trial, uh, I was asked to represent Quaker women to observe the Women's Ordination Conference. Mm -hmm. And it was the most amazing experience of my life. I walked into a room where there were women who were the heads, the abbesses, literally, the, mm -hmm. the heads of religious orders around the world. And the spiritual power in that room was overwhelming. You could feel that energy. Isn't that true? It was just, oh. it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Because I thought, how can this be denied? It's here, it's real. These women are touched by the sacred. It lives through them. And how can they live being denied in this way? And it was just, it was such a moment for me because I realized that I, had always thought of myself as a spiritual person, but I had grown up in a community where women were treated as equal. Among Quakers, women have been equal. I had models from the time I grew up. And so I, it just hit me so hard at that moment. And I think it was shortly thereafter that you asked me, would I be willing to be a peacekeeper at one of the organizations? Right. Yeah. And you know, it, it just blew my mind. I was, you know, it was it was truly to be touched by the core of love in these women. And that was what gave me the first sense that I ever had that the core of feminism is truly the love of women. And it was, you were talking about what was a moving experience, what was the experience that affected you. I think it was being there. And I think it was then coming back and you saying to me, can you, will you be a peacekeeper? Yeah. Oh, and Marianne was a peacekeeper for the second a regular ordination of the Episcopal women, the one that was held um, in St. Stephen, Stephen in the Incarnation Church in Washington, D.C. Uh, now I can't remember the date. It would have been 75, September 75, um, and we were peacekeepers. But uh, I think I, I want to add to that by saying that there, I was very welcome in many of the religious establishments by the closeted feminists who really wanted to get out of their closet and liked the affirmation that I brought them as a secular feminist. So I, I became a very popular uh, speaker in convents. 
Um, so much so that I can't remember which of, which of you it was. I think Carol Pudliner Sweeney was one of the ones that was behind it. They, they presented me with a shirt. They were kind of worried about my orientation. And it said that it reads, celibacy is not hereditary. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of you guys did that? Oh, but I do remember the shirt. <laughs> so, like, you know, I was welcome there, and I also served on the Justice for Women Working Group with the National Council of Churches. But on the other hand, uh, there were feminist women who had been told they couldn't be spiritual and, femi and uh, feminist at the same time. And so as I made that possible in my workshops, there, there was a tremendous outpouring uh, of, of that kind of energy, of the spiritual energy, of the commitment, of the joy of not being denied your spiritual side just because you are a feminist. And in New Jersey, and I can't remember who it was, but it was with the Alice Paul New Jersey chapter, one of the founders had died. And the women came to me and said, we went to the burial. And before they lowered the casket into the grave, we put ERA bumper stickers on it. <laughs> oh, and, and it was so right, and it felt so good. And I said to them, yes, and don't ever let anyone take that away from The, wow. You've been really quiet, and we have talked Northern Virginia, Northern Virginia, Northern Virginia. I was a carpetbagger. You were absolutely one of our very best carpetbaggers. Yeah, she, she, I didn't have a car at the time, and she would call me up and she'd say, we're going out to Oakton to pick at the Mormon Steakhouse. <laughs> and my, I mean, my attitude as I got my coat was, where's Oakton? <laughs> <laughs> but, but one of the fun I lived things. in D.C., and Virginia was like a She was in a foreign country. country. But she yeah. was able to cross the bridge. <laughs> right. You know, and, but one of, one of the, the two, two of these brilliances, I thought, were during the Fairfax 19 campaign, which was the 1970 nine general election here in Virginia, um, Lee did two spectacular things. One is she turned her apartment into a hindquarters. And it was right on the, very, very close to a DC subway station. And so people who we contacted, and we started using DC lists, and even Maryland lists who worked in DC would go to Lee's apartment after work and do phone banking. Mm -hmm. So we had a phone, we had three phones there. Yeah, that was, a, that was the maximum number the phone company would install in a single one-bedroom apartment. <laughs> we didn't have cell phones then. <laughs> yeah. and, and so, and Lee did that. And then the other thing that I always loved hearing Lee do with her sort of New England dry humor, Lee did a great deal of volunteer recruiting by phone. She just spent hours and hours and hours calling people saying, can you come to the hindquarters? And they would say, oh, I'd really love to, to, but you know, I'm so busy. And Lee in her dry New England accent would say, well, I do understand, but then you know, there are so many things that you could do, and the stamps still have to be paid for. <laughs> <laughs> and she, I, one month, raised $2,000 while recruiting volunteers. Guilt mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> With well, great was, finesse. With great finesse. So, you know, one of the things that, that I think careful with you. Lee was wonderful, but we had, and we did have some other folks from, from outside, and we had folks coming in from Pennsylvania from on weekends, over. and and from all over. We, we had, had so many people coming little in Karen from New Jersey. The legislature tried to pass a law. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, truly, remember we had people inside the polls. Yeah. Yes. Because then you could listen to, um, Talk about Marianne. Marianne. Yes. For posterity. <laughs> Loudly and clearly, not, not so that the microphone in posterity could hear you, but so that the deaf election judge could hear you. Uh, and, and candidates were entitled to have uh, what they call poll, poll watchers inside who could hear what was being said. So we arranged to have, through, through police and different foot patching you together, poll watchers in precincts all over Northern Virginia. Alexander Arlington, Fairfax County, both of the states in the tip. But, but we 
use women for, for that job because they weren't women who necessarily knew other people. We used a lot of women who came in from up to basically Washington, D.C., North, <laughs> you know, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, even New York, uh, Delaware, Maryland. Maryland that, so we had them sitting side of polls. So this it was, it's so, it, it, the defeat of Thompson, part of the, the, uh, the uh, backlash to that and this whole, uh, our whole political operation was the legislature, then I think they succeeded actually, just passing a law saying you could not sit inside the polls of Virginia on election day unless you were, I think it was unless you were a registered voter in that precinct, I think they made it that, that narrow. So that was one of the laws that they passed in reaction to our efforts that, that passed. Of course, their ban the van law never passed. You have to talk about the band, yes. band the band. Talk band the band. Talk band about band your band. band. What my bands? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Emily, yeah, but you know, Sweeney, um, mm -hmm. was one of the first people that was involved in, in painting it with yeah. the Virginia seal on the side that showed. A woman in Crozet actually painted it. Oh, okay. Crozet, yeah. Huh. And Good, we had a poster of it. Well, <coughs> anyway, both sides of the van, you know, was painted with the text of the ERA. And the Virginia Seal, which features a woman with one bare breast with her foot <laughs> You mean a boob a, out of the, oh. A, 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 oh, boob, a, a boob, a visible a boob. boob. Oh, I'm shocked. And her foot on the, on the uh, chest of a tyrant man. Yes, the tyrant, that's always, the tyrants is our Virginia uh, motto. And, with, uh, with his crown toppled off. Yes. <laughs> in which we put the initials of various legislators that we <laughs> <laughs> but the offensive part, well, you're going to you no, there. Well, no, Emily, go. well, the Virginia General Assembly decided that they were tired of having the ERA van parked conspicuously at the state capitol building. <laughs> so they passed, a, they tried to pass a law that would not allow the Virginia State State Seal to be on cars or any vehicle. This was their <coughs> approach. Oops. Until oh they God. discovered Oops. that That's every Oops. until every First state trooper's car in the state would have to be repainted. <laughs> and they contemplated the cost of that. So that went nowhere. Not only that it was the state license tax. Yeah, it was it was so because the state license tax has the seal was ubiquitous. Yeah, it did yeah. The, 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 the so that, that, that was the second version. The first version of the legislation was that you couldn't display a bare breast. Oh, on, I didn't. Yeah, didn't a, bare, a bare breast on a, a on a vehicle. On the <laughs> <of Virginia. laughs> Which they they sort of again did the complication. Oh, oh, oh my gosh! Every state-owned vehicle has the Virginia seal on it with a bare breast, which means if this passes, we're going to have to cover all those breasts. <laughs> <laughs> so that one died. Um, you know, one one of the things that uh, you know, Pat, I guess Pat went and left her ERA Times. Uh, Edition, you know, that we put out during the legislative session. She left those with Jean before she went, went to Italy, and we, or part of what we need to do is recoup those because I think a lot of the, the story, the, 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 the sort of details, are contained within that. Yeah, and that's an issue. I know something about uh, a police officer came to my house one day. I lived in Holmes Run Acres in Fairfax County near Annandale and said, I'm going to arrest your son. Now, my husband had a very high government job, and I had no idea what an arrest record of a juvenile would do, but I didn't want to have that found out at some point that it was a serious <laughs> issue. So I walked down to the park with him. Peter had been, my son's name is Peter, had been uh, pulling weeds out of the mud because it had been raining, and he was just sitting there pulling weeds. And this officer decided to have to arrest him. Well, I made a big fuss about it, and I had done a, a presentation at the Audubon Society that morning, so I was really well dressed for a suburban housewife. <laughs> that may have had some effect on it. And a car pulled up, and a sort of heavy set man got out, listened to the discussion, and my husband came home, and I could see his car, and I got out in the street and waved crazily and said, my husband's coming home, trying to get him to come down, and the, the guy that got out of the police car that had come, uh, unmarked big car that had come out 
said, let me walk you up to your house. And uh, so we walked up to my house and he, we stayed out in the carpool and he talked to me and he said, I won't tell